So we're back for another media law chat. I am here with Tori Ekstrand. So Tori, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from and what case we're going to be talking about today. Sure. So um, Tori Ekstrand, I'm an associate professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and I'm co-director of the Center for Media Law and Policy. Uh, we're going to talk about International News Service versus Associated Press, or for short, INSVAP. Yeah, and this probably has a special spot in your heart, having worked for the AP. Um, and I yeah. know uh, with your tremendous interest in intellectual property issues, uh, this has to be a special one. So give us a little bit of background. It's not a case that a lot of um, undergrad courses cover when it comes to intellectual property. It sometimes gets uh, left at the wayside. So give us a little bit of background on the case. Yeah, so um, the case is really interesting because it's about something that's still happening today. It's about the theft of uh, of intellectual property, but it's about the theft in particular of facts, and that is facts of news, right? And so generally, copyright law or intellectual property law leaves open for redistribution um, facts, right? We don't copyright facts. But in this particular case, International News Service, this case goes back to 1918, this um, INS was owned by um, Hearst. And for those listening who remember or know something about uh, William Randolph Hearst, um, he was particularly dynamic um, <laughs> uh, media leader, and he um, was very aggressive, and, and his staff, his, his uh, employees were particularly aggressive. And so in this case, INS, uh, on a routine basis, in something like at least a dozen instances that the AP was able to um, track, um, took, stole, AP news. And what they were stealing primarily were the facts of news. Um, and so that made it problematic for a copyright claim um, because they're stealing information and not necessarily the actual expression. Mm -hmm. So the court in this instance, the Supreme Court, when it got this case, um, considered the case under principles of unfair competition, which is state common law. So this is different than right federal copyright law. And of course, both areas of law were pretty different in 1918 than they are today, but the court ultimately determined that um, INS had unfairly, under unfair competition rules, taken um, these news facts from the AP. Um, they had misappropriated, is the legal term, um, those news facts. And that particular case, or the, the ruling out of that case, formulated what we know today as the hot news doctrine. And that's this idea that um, if another news entity or another media entity takes the facts of someone else's um, publication of their labor, um, that party may be liable for um, misappropriation under this hot news doctrine. So that's kind of a capsule of the case. I've always really enjoyed the hot news term. It just seems that yeah. you, know, you try to reread all these cases and they just sometimes feel dull as dirt, but then they become something like the hot news doctrine. Yes. <laughs> um, there was a lot of criticism of this, particularly in the Holmes and Brandeis dissent. So, so you know, where do people think the court went wrong? Um, so in the, in the dissents, but even now today, there, there are some speculation or some a discussion, debate around whether this is a good principle to have, right? Because as you pointed out earlier on, it really does conflict with um, some very basic rules or tenets around um, intellectual property law, which tell us that facts are open to reuse, like we shouldn't be locking up facts. One of the important things about the case to keep in mind is that the court said, yes, the news organizations have some ability to hold on to those facts or have a property right in those facts, but it's a limited property right. Like it doesn't last forever. The question becomes, well, how long <laughs> should those rights last? Um, and so this dis the dissent's problem was with that, in addition to the fact that they felt, um, Brandeis felt that, um, you know, this was something for the legislatures to hash out. Like this wasn't, this shouldn't be judge-made or court-made doctrine in any sense. But the hot news doctrine has carried some weight over its 100 year plus history because there are still instances in which news organizations um, take one another's news or information outlets now in the internet age take each other's news or data and that's sort of the interesting place where things have have changed um, but yeah it comes to the, the claim itself comes so close to being 
uh, a copyright claim that that really upsets or unnerves uh, sort of legal minds around intellectual property. And I think the other part now for sort of the current take on the doctrine is, you know, how can you possibly define what is hot news mm -hmm. in the 21st century, right? News and information move so quickly now. News and information are hot for only just a very, like, such a, 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 a short slice of time now. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of hard to say that people have a hot news right or protection in the facts of something when move, news moves it as quickly as it does. Um, but I can talk about arguments against that if you're interested. I yeah, well, I'm interested in all of it. I could, I could <laughs> go on with this stuff forever, but have there been any recent cases where people have asserted these rights? Where you, you yeah, so this, this um, you know, it's, uh, it, it has a tendency, this case, to kind of like ebb and flow, at least its presidential value, uh, INS v. AP. But um, fly on the wall, the fly on the wall case versus Barclays is a second circuit decision. And in that case, flyonthewall.com is this kind of scrappy uh, news upstart that uh, it's a financial news site. The information that they were taking were these um, stock valuations. So all of these different bro uh, brokerage houses would give a particular rating to a stock. And what Fly on the Wall was doing was taking or scraping um, that information and republishing it on, on its site without permission. So these are basically numbers, they're facts, right? So technically facts should be open to reuse. Um, but Barclays and Merrill Lynch and a couple of these other brokerage houses took fly on the wall to court. They, uh, there were a couple of different claims, but one of the claims was a hot news claim saying, hey, you know, like we produce this data, this is our property, um, and, the, and they're unfairly competing with us. Um, the district court in that case actually ruled for the brokerage houses, which was really weird. Uh, to a lot of us, we were kind of surprised. And additionally, the district court in that case said, well, um, that information, those facts, yes, they're proprietary, um, they're protected under the hot news doctrine, and we're going to say they're protected for 30 minutes, um, which is super interesting. It was the first time we'd ever gotten like a time on how much hot news is hot, right? Uh, but the Second Circuit overturned that. The Second Circuit said, no, actually, federal copyright law um, prevails, or what we call preempts. Mm -hmm. um, this state law doctrine. So the state law doctrine of hot news is by some accounts or some observers, some scholars say fairly weak now in the Second Circuit as a result of that case. But I will say that in some other uh, jurisdictions, hot news is still has some power. Um, the state of Illinois has historically been very protective of information gathering um, hot news rights and news gathering hot news rights. So they have oftentimes ruled in favor of, in state level cases, um, uh, people who produce facts and then others attempt to, to take them um, uh, and republish. I think the other place where this has become really relevant lately um, has to do with uh, databases. So, um, you know, this idea of being able to take facts and information from various databases and scrape that data, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and repurpose it. Right. Right. So technically speaking, if you're taking discrete piece, pieces or discrete numbers out of databases and then repurposing it, you might be able to argue that that's a fair use. That's simply facts that we're I'm taking and reusing and mm -hmm. nobody has any proprietary rights over that. Um, you know, there are a couple of different issues here. Um, copyright law might be relevant in a case like that if what you're taking is the selection, coordination, and arrangement of the database. But if all you're taking are the discrete numbers, you might get away with it. But a misappropriation claim or a hot news claim might be valid in such a case. And in a number of cases over in Europe, um, a similar type of claim can be made under the European Data Directive, where mm -hmm. they don't allow um, always the scraping of other people's databases um, off the internet or other um, other platforms, other other digital data sets. So yeah, it's so it's so fascinating to me to think about it in the data context currently, and, and go back to this you know World War One era case where I mean the reason INS needed to steal in the first place is that their reporters couldn't transmit over allied telegraph lines, right? right? That, right. The, that the yeah. 
first the place, allies first were so place. ticked off by Hearst that they yes. restricted access. They didn't get data access to the telegraph lines. So yes. now that we're thinking about it, its real importance today comes to comes comes with data scraping. It's just kind of a funny coincidence to me. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it has to do. I think what it, what it appeals to, or sort of the the moral value of this, which copyright law doesn't want to really want to get involved in, and neither does the First Amendment. Right? We don't want to make judgments about the content of material. Mm -hmm. But there is something about the fact that we put our time and our effort and our labor into um, collecting facts mm -hmm. that that courts do understand and that copyright will um, shall I say appreciate in certain circumstances you know so you know to the extent that you bring some originality to the creation of a phone book like in the Feist case mm -hmm. um, because you have unique selection, coordination, and arrangement of a phone book or some kind of data listing. Like copyright will protect that overall mm -hmm. work that you've done, but it's, again, it's not gonna protect those discrete units. And oftentimes the discrete units of data are the stuff, is the stuff that's the most valuable. Right. And that's where an unfair competition claim can be potentially helpful when you know data scraping is going on. A good example that listeners might like um, our viewers might relate to, if you think about um, these uh, these sort of uh, sites that aggregate data. So you're looking for a really good airfare, mm -hmm. and um, there are sites that will aggregate all of these other airfare sites that have right. data on it, and that's, that's actually like kind yeah, of right. So that's scraping essentially the data of these other sites. Right now, there's nothing in federal law that prohibits that, that kind of activity might be actionable under the European Data Directive, but it is not actionable here in the States. But I could see a really valuable misappropriation argument. Um, you know, if I'm one of these other sites whose work and data putting together prices for airlines, like, mm -hmm. that, like that to me, I wouldn't so much love if someone else is taking all of that work. And even right. we're talking about like numbers. Yeah, and the airlines themselves. And so you've seen in some cases, some airlines really push back and not agree um, to be part of aggregator sites. Um, mm -hmm. that they just, they, they want everything coming directly through the front door. They right. don't do that by suing, right? They do it by making it really, really difficult to scrape. You know, so they right. do, it's like a technological protection of their internet. Right. Property. Yeah, cool. some of them, some of them will definitely do that. I mean, there, as with all things in media law or just the law generally, sometimes there are business solutions to this right. that businesses will will find uh, or 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 create. And so, you know, and in the states, are are we often opt for the business solution over the legal solution, or we try, and particularly in the First Amendment realm, right? We don't want the heavy hand of government coming in to necessarily exactly. regulate all this. But yeah. it is. It gets we about the development of technology, you know, it moves so much faster than the law can keep up with that mm -hmm. sometimes the business solutions are the more nimble, <laughs> the, yes. the nimble responses. Yeah, they can move more quickly for sure. For yeah. sure. So, so do you see uh, do you see any fundamental changes coming to the hot news doctrine? Or do you think you said that it seems to be kind of losing its influence? Um, you know, anything anything coming on the pipeline that would change the way we look at this sort of thing? Yeah, I'm not sure the doctrine itself will um, necessarily have the kind of power that it did, but I would I will say that some of the principles behind it have some power. And where I see those principles having power is in the discussion about who owns the data about ourselves, mm. right? Who owns those raw facts about us? Um, and this sort of speaks to uh, what Europe has done with the general data protection regulation, the GDPR, right, which um, give citizens within the EU a certain amount of control over data about themselves. And this matters in issues of government surveillance, right? This matters in issues of private or corporate surveillance where citizens in the EU have some power to control what, what information about them goes where. Mm -hmm. um, and also about like where all that information is stored. Um, all of these are big issues. And so a lot of times in media law, we think of that as solely about a privacy right. Mm -hmm. But it, it, to some extent, there are a lot of scholars that talk about it as a, as a property right, like that we have a property right in the information about ourselves. 
Um, and to the extent that that information about ourselves is used unfairly in some way in the marketplace without our knowledge or consent, like that's a problem. So I think principles behind um, the hot news doctrine or the or misappropriation in general apply um, here in the discussion about what are we going to do in the United States about um, privacy regulation around data. Um, yeah, I, and I think it, it, I, I talk to students quite often about how um, media law makes such strange bed, brings together such strange bedfellows that you have these you know, really disparate people. Like, you, you know, you could have 5-4 decision after 5-4 decision on every other issue, and you'll have a 9-0 on a First Amendment issue. It's just very, it's just always fascinating to me. The um, whether you frame something as privacy rights or property rights, again, try, so tends to bring in people who would be ideologically different together into the protection of individual information. So, you know, while uh, you might have, um, you know, a, a, a democratic socialist in France who's really interested in the privacy protection, you might have a really solid conservative say, when you frame this as a property right, then I can see how we would, how, how and why we would want to protect this. And I think it's something that's coming up today with, you know, how much our data trails could be part of contract, contract yeah. tracing um, for, for coronavirus. It's yeah. just, you know, you get this, this odd uh, groups of people who you just really don't think, you know, they would never sort of cluster together, but they come together on these issues. So, so yeah. you know, from 1918 to 2020, we're still trying to wrestle with all of this sort of stuff. So, well, yeah. thank you so much, Tori. I really appreciate you joining us. I know my students will really enjoy it. Um, they, you know, they love it when, they seem to love it when I geek out about things. <laughs> so intellectual property sounds dry, but it's not. It's got a lifetime of stories in it. Well, this is great that you're doing it. I mean, I think media law at its heart has a lot of like really great and cool stories. I mean, there's the law to learn and the legal facts and the doctrines to learn. I always tell my students, but at the heart of every media law case is a really interesting story about two people that are pretty mad at each other. <laughs> so there's, a, you know, there's a distinct human element in all of it that I think for those of us who appreciate media and journalism, like we, it, it resonates with us. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Good luck with the rest of uh, your semester as you right. as you finish up in North Carolina. And we're coming to a close here at Wisconsin. And uh, here's to uh, everything being a little bit more normal for fall semester. Yes, this was great. Thanks, Katie. Right. Thanks, Tori. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.